morning, everyone, and welcome to our hybrid service, our morning service together. Welcome if you're watching on Zoom or or YouTube. I pray that you'll have a a, a really blessed time as we come and as we look at God's Word together. And of course, welcome to everybody here who's in the building. It's good that we can gather together in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If if you're not sure who I am, uh, my name's Mark, and I'll be leading the service this morning. And then uh, a little bit later on, I'll be preaching as we continue our series in Luke's Gospel. We're going to read from God's Word. We're going to read from Psalm 134. Psalm 134. And, and, and of course, the, the problem is at the moment, especially here in the building, we can't sing together, but we can read Scripture together. So what we're going to do is we're going to read Psalm 134 together. Don't worry, it's only three verses, so it won't take long. But we can read it out loud together. So if you just follow me as we read these, these wonderful words. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven and earth. And isn't it great uh, that, that we've got these psalms that, that drive us to praise, that want us to, to praise the Lord? Uh, and we're going to sing a song now d- doing that. We're going to praise the Lord by singing Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through, the creation, through creation. Of course, you at home can sing out loud. But in the building, we're going to have to sing in our hearts. But we, we can also be expressive. And, and that psalm gives us license to raise our hands if we want to praise the Lord. That we're going to have to find ways of, of responding differently as we come and as we praise the Lord together by, uh, by listening and singing to this song, Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation. Jesus is Lord. Shall we pray together? 
Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for the fact that we can proclaim that truth. Jesus is Lord. He is, he is Lord over all creation. Lord, that you, you, the Father, and, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the triune God created this world. We thank you that your creation is beautiful. We thank you that, that we, we see your fingerprints in your creation. And we thank you that, uh, that though we messed up, that though we rebelled, though we sinned, though we wanted to go our own way, we wanted to become gods ourselves. And we still want to. You had a salvation plan. You sent Jesus. You sent Jesus to save us so that we can sing and we can cry not only that Jesus is Lord, but that Jesus is Savior. Lord, Father, this morning, I pray that you would help us as we consider our hearts, as we consider our sin, as we consider our rebellion. You would help to, to gravitate our hearts and our eyes and our minds back to Jesus, Lord, whatever week we've had, whatever distractions we've had, whatever troubles we've been going through. Help us this morning to be refreshed by your grace, to be, be refreshed by your spirit, helping us to see more of that wonderful truth that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Saviour. Help us to cling on to that. And may you help our hearts sing as a result of that wonderful truth, the good news that Jesus has come to save us from our sins. Help us to continue to turn to you. Help us to continue to praise you. And as we read God's word this morning, as we, as we look at God's word this morning, help us to focus our eyes and our thoughts and our minds upon Jesus. We can pray in his precious name. Amen. So it's time for the kids' talk, and Kat has prepared a video for us to watch. question. Surely Moses had already seen God's glory. After all, he'd been rescued as a baby and he had heard God speaking from a burning bush and he had seen um, God send the plagues on the Egyptians when they would not allow the Israelites to go. And he had seen the Red Sea parted so that they could escape. And then he'd seen the Ten Commandments given. Surely Moses has really seen God's glory in these wonderful acts. But the problem is, today Moses was feeling a bit nervous. He needed to know that God would be with him and would help him to lead the Israelites on to the Promised Land. And so he needed God's reassurance and God's help. So he pleaded, please show me your glory. And the wonderful thing is that that is exactly what God did. God told Moses that he would make his goodness pass in front of him, but he would hide him in the opening of a rock. So, because Moses must not see God's face. For no one could see God's face and live because God is so perfect and so holy. Now, skip further forward in the Bible to the New Testament and Jesus talking to his disciples. And Philip, one of his disciples, said, Lord, show us the Father. But he didn't get the same response, not the same response as, as um, Moses did. 
Because Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? I have been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You see, what Philip hadn't realised was that he had seen God's glory because he'd seen Jesus. Earlier in John 1, 14, it says, The Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. That's John 1, 14. So this Word was Jesus. When we see Jesus, we see God's glory. So when we pray this prayer, when we pray to see God's glory, we can be assured that we have already seen God's glory in Jesus. So whatever your situation today, whether it be something tricky at school or a nursery or something else that's worrying you, you can pray, God, show me your glory and he will point us to Jesus and the way that Jesus died for us and loves us and forgives us. Oh, and by the way, when God passed by Moses, the Bible tells us that this was his response. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Lord, he said, if I found favour in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And we can pray a similar prayer today. As we see God's glory in Jesus, we can ask him to help us, to forgive us our sins and to take us on to a wonderful inheritance in heaven with him one day. Thanks for listening. freezing at the end there but what wonderful words of assurance there that cat teacher taught us that the glory of god in jesus christ came down into this world went to the cross and therefore we can enter into god's presence without fear and this is what uh, our bible reading now in hebrews tells us uh, prepares us uh, as we seek to praise him we read these wonderful words Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We have full assurance that we can enter into God's presence. And of course, it's only by grace that we can do that. And that's our, our next song that we're going to praise God together. Uh, we, can, we can praise God by singing in our hearts or singing out loud at home. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb.
Now we're going to read from God's Word. We're going to read from Scripture. If you've got your Bibles, please open to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to be reading from verses 26 to 56. This is God's Word that we're reading, and Joe is going to come and read it for us. So Luke 23, verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that have never bore, that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this, this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The reading goes on in verse 50. Now there was a man, a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandments. 
Well, before we come and we see what God has to say to us from his word, let us consider the truths uh, sung in this song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's, let's, let's make this a prayer as we, can, as we seek to come to God this morning. Turn our eyes upon Jesus. So at home, of course, continue to sing out loud. And, and here, help us to sing in our hearts as we consider these truths. encourage you to have your Bibles open at Luke chapter 23, starting from verse 26. Let me pray before we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, open up our eyes now to Jesus, to the wonders of the cross, 
to the realities of the cross and the consequences of the cross, what it means to us. Lord, would you fill us with your spirit now and help us to see Jesus clearly. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let me start by asking you a question. What's the most important event in history? Now, as soon as I say that, that the room and those listening at home are split into two camps. One half of you at the mention of history have been programmed to switch off. And right now you're thinking about what you're having for dinner. A little bit later, you, you really just couldn't be interested at all in, in this question. But the other half of the room, well, you're rubbing your hands. I can see some of you already thinking, well, what's in my top ten list? Could it be Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon? Could it be 1066 and the Norman invasion? Could it be the, the, the invention of the printing press? Could it be the signing of the Declaration of Independence? The outbreak of two world wars? The, the Russian Revolution? Putting man on the moon? The internet? Well, as important as all those events are, can I say they are not the most important events in history? The most important event in history is the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hands down, that wins every time. And notice I said the death and resurrection of Jesus because it's, it's one event with two parts. And we've arrived here in our, our series after Jesus' trial. And, and we're going to see here in, in this part the crucifixion. But then next week, we're going to see the beginning of the resurrection. We're going to look at the resurrection in, th in three consecutive Sundays, starting, of course, with Easter Sunday next week. But we've just had the trial of Jesus. And after the trial of Jesus comes this most important event, Jesus' death. It's the event that turned the world upside down. And this is why everybody should pay attention, whether they find history boring or not, because for here we see Jesus doing what he was sent to do, go to the cross and die. Here we see the cross that turned the world upside down. But why is the cross so important? Well, I'm sure we, if, we, if we got our heads together, we could think of quite a few good reasons but this passage gives us three big, broad reasons that we can tease out. It shows us, first of all, the reality of judgment. Then it provides a saviour. Then it demands a response. Why is the cross so important? Because of the reality of judgment, it provides a saviour and it demands a response. So let's dive straight in with uh, the reality of judgment from verses 26 to 31. Can you imagine walking to the place of your execution, knowing that you were innocent. You were beaten rather badly before the verdict was even given, but now you've been subject to a scourging designed to tear and rip your skin from your flesh. Then you're told to carry the crossbeam weighing around about 18 kilograms that you'll be nailed to up out of the city to a place called the Skull, to Golgotha, or as what we call Calvary. This was Jesus on that first Good Friday 2,000 years ago. He was so exhausted, probably from the loss of blood and from the beating, that the Romans got someone else to, to carry the cross for him. Poor Simon of Cyrene from North Africa probably just came into Jerusalem for the Passover, ends up being press-ganged into carrying Jesus' cross behind him. And this is where we plunge right into our passage. And notice, what is the first noise that Jesus hears as he's walking up to his execution? As he's stumbling up to the cross, he hears weeping. Verse 27. Verse 27 reads, A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And this seems entirely appropriate, doesn't it? Weeping seems like the res right response. If you're going to a place of execution for crimes you didn't commit, you'd, you'd expect some weeping, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd want some people to cry for you, <laughs> some people to care for you. So what Jesus says in response to their weeping is staggering in verses 28 to 31, isn't it? 
He turns the conversation upside down by saying, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. As he walks to the cross, he takes the focus off himself and onto future judgments. We, we read, don't we, in, in verse 28, he, when he says, he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? This is why the cross is so important. Because Jesus is showing us the reality of judgment. And he is, he's saying there's two judgments. And he's not thinking about the first here. The one that he is walking towards. He's thinking of the second. He's thinking of the destruction of Jerusalem that is pointing us to the picture of final judgment. Do you know this is the third time in less than a week that Jesus is pointing us to future judgment? We saw it when he wept over Jerusalem in, in chapter 9 and verse 41. We saw it when he, he was talking about it in, in chapter 21. And here he says, this will be a time in verse 30 that will be so bad you will cry out for help from the mountains to fall on you and hide you. The quote there is from Hosea chapter 10 and verse 8. Uh, which is prophesying about the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, just as that was a sign of God's judgment, so is the fall of Jerusalem, which we know happened 40 years later in AD 70 after a four long year bloody siege. And so what Jesus is saying in verse 31, he's saying, if the green tree that's me that is innocent is killed, how much easier will it be for the dry tree to catch fire and to be killed and to be judged. This should be a wake-up call to the reality of judgment. And yet Jerusalem's fall really is just that foreshadowing, as I said. Just read these words from Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, which again quotes Hosea 10, verse 8, when it says, The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? It's two judgments. The one where Jesus will die in the place of his people and the second one. The one where those who have rejected Jesus will be judged and face the wrath of the Lamb who, and who will send people to hell for their rebellion against God. And we should be weeping for those who will taste the second judgment, who will experience God's wrath. I know in the West, in particular, we don't like the idea of hell, do we? We don't like the idea of punishment, but we all believe in justice, don't we? And hell is where true justice is done. All evil is punished. And this is why the cross is so important. Because, because Jesus, even at the hour when he's going to his place of execution, is forcing us to think about the reality of judgment. And this is why Jesus came. To take the judgment that we deserve. It's why the cross is the most important event in history, because the cross provides an alternative judgment. Or as we see in our second point, it provides a saviour in verses 32 to 49. And Luke continues to tell us why the cross is so important and turns the world upside down when Jesus speaks for the first time from the cross. We learn in verses 32 and 33 that Jesus' walk ends in crucifixion next to two criminals. And then we read these wonderful words in verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. I remember reading years ago about a man from another religion turning to Christianity because of this verse. Because of the powerful reality of a forgiving God. You see, all other religions make demands of you, want you to work off your debt, 
So, and you have no certainty of salvation. But here, Jesus, instead of praying for God to smite them, instead of praying for God to judge them, says, Father, forgive them. To forgive those who have nailed him to the cross. Because the cross means Jesus is taking our debt and offers us forgiveness freely if we come to Christ. We have a God of forgiveness because of the cross. A God who saves us because Jesus stayed on the cross. A gospel with one saviour, a gospel that provides us with a saviour. But of course, many in the crowd at the time weren't there really to seek forgiveness, were they? They were there to see Jesus killed, executed. And so we see in verse 35, the rule, Jewish rulers in particular mocking Jesus. In fact, it, three times from three different groups, we see people mocking Jesus, suggesting to Jesus, Jesus, if you really are the Messiah, if you really are the chosen one, save yourself. Come on, save yourself. So we read, don't we, in verse 35, we read these words. He, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Or from the Roman soldiers in verse 36. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Or, or from the criminal on the cross, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. These weren't earnest pleas, but cruel taunts. Jew, Gentile convicted criminals, Jewish elite, were all saying the same thing. But the irony, the irony of course is this, by not saving himself, Jesus saves us. He suffered the taunts and the torture and the agony of the cross as his diaphragm is slowly crushed, he's slowly dying from asphyxiation because by not saving himself, by not giving in to the taunts of the crowd, he saves us. The gospel provides us with a saviour. That's why the cross is so important. The true Messiah is the Messiah that doesn't save himself but saves his people. And there seems to be at least one person in this whole crowd who seems to get some of this. And it's the other criminal hanging next to Jesus on the cross, as we see in verse 40. Now we read in the accounts of Mark and Matthew that this criminal joined the crowd at some point in insulting Jesus. So there must have been a, a moment where, where this criminal, this thief on the cross, changed, saw that actually, no, Jesus is the real deal. Maybe it was when Jesus said those amazing words, Father, forgive them. And then this, this thief on the cross, he, he realised that this Jesus was innocent. He was dying a criminal's death as an innocent man. Whereas this thief and the other thief was dying a criminal's death as a guilty man, getting what he deserved, as he says in verse 41. There seems to be a, 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 this, this thief, this criminal, gets the importance of the cross, that, that Jesus is the Messiah, that this is a gospel with one saviour, that the gospel and the cross is important because it provides us with a saviour. When he says in verse 42, these amazing words, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, the one hanging on the cross, nailed to the cross, being crucified, and yet this thief, this criminal says to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what was Jesus' reply? Well, it wasn't, you're a criminal, you deserve death. It wasn't, sorry, you should have tried harder in life, it's too late, you should have been a better person. No. It was verse 43. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. How comforting are those words to us? To know at the, the moment of death, our loved ones who trusted Jesus are with their saviour in paradise. The moment they die. 
There's no delay. It's paradise now with Jesus. After death comes eternal life. After death comes paradise with Christ. And that's why the cross is so important. Jesus' death gives us life with him. What is paradise? Can I say it's not what the song says, some spirit in the sky? No. The word paradise has, has connotations of beauty and delight and can be defined as a garden. So immediately our minds really should be going back to the Garden of Eden, shouldn't it? And, and, and Adam and Eve, God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. Only this is better for being in paradise in the spiritual realm, not the sky. It's to be with Jesus. And to look forward to the day when the beauty and the light of the new Eden takes place when Jesus returns and we'll be living in our physical bodies in the new heavens and the new earth. Paradise now is heaven, the beautiful place where God dwells, the delightful place where Jesus sits on his throne. And the thief on the cross on that very day experiences that beauty and that delight with his king. Colin Smith, in his excellent little book, Heaven, How I Got Here, the story of the thief on the cross. Uh, I don't know if you've read it. He, he imagines what this man must have been going through. So he, he kind of creates uh, in, in his head what, what, what this man must have been going through in his final hours on the cross. And so writes from this man's perspective uh, some beautiful words. He writes these words, scripture says anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse, Deuteronomy 21, 23. And here I was with Jesus hanging on a tree. The fear of this curse had led me to ask Jesus to remember me and to my astonishment, he had promised me paradise. As a thief condemned by the law, I knew that after death I would face God's judgment, but Jesus gave me his word that I would be in paradise. So where did my judgment go? I now know the answer, and the more I think about it, the more astonishing I find it to be. The judgment that was due to me fell on Jesus. The crowd was sure that Jesus was under God's curse, and in a sense they were right. He was under God's curse, but the curse did not fall on him for his own sins. He had none. He, he came under the curse for the sins of others. He endured my judgment so that I could enter into his reward. He endured my judgment so that I could enter into his reward. That's paradise. Brilliantly captures, doesn't it, as well, why the, why the cross is so important. This is a gospel with one saviour taking God's judgment so we, we can take his reward, so we can take paradise, being with Jesus. And Jesus is how we get there. And this is what we read, don't we? And then in verses 44 to 46... In verses 44 to 46, Jesus has now been hanging on the cross for about three hours. And then we read these words. It was about now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. We learned last week, didn't we, when Jesus was arrested, that Jesus said in, in Luke 23, uh, 22, verse 53, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. And here we have, in a sense, the climax of that darkness, when literal darkness covers the land for three hours. And there's probably a couple of things that are going on here. First, the, the very real darkness is, is the sign of that cosmic battle being fought between Jesus and Satan. The darkness might be reigning, but in reality, the cross is the hour of Satan's defeat. The cross turns the world upside down. In the moment of Jesus' darkness, he has victory. Defeat becomes victory because this really is the cross that just, it just turns everything upside down. But of course, and you get this picture quite vividly in the line, the witch in the wardrobe, if you like children's books. Aslan's death means winter is over and spring has come. 
It's the cross that turns the world upside down, that turns darkness into, into victory. In Jesus' triumph over Satan at the cross. But secondly, and probably more importantly, is darkness is often synonymous in the Old Testament with judgment, with God's judgment and, and the day of the Lord. That, that second judgment that we were thinking about that ultimately is the punishment of hell. And Jesus himself talks about hell as the, the outer darkness. And so that three hours of darkness is the graphic illustration of Jesus taking our punishment, taking our judgment, being judged by the Father so that we might be justified, being forsaken by the Father so that we might be forgiven, being rejected by the Father so that we might be redeemed. Now we have to be careful here. For by saying Jesus was rejected by the Father and was forsaken by the Father, I am not saying the Trinity somehow split and the Son was separated from the Father at the cross. That's impossible. You you cannot divide God. Just like 2 plus 2 equals 5 is impossible. I'm sure, Derek, that's true. Uh, You can't subtract the Son from the Trinity. It's just, it's impossible maths. But because the Son of God became man, because the Son of God became flesh, was called Jesus and was God's Messiah, the chosen one. Jesus, the God-man, experienced rejection in his human nature. He took our place and he took our judgment so we might be declared innocent as the innocent one. He was punished so we might enjoy paradise. He tasted darkness and death so we might know the light of life. He experienced hell so we might have heaven. So we might know God. Actually, that's what the the curtain of the temple being torn in two shows us, doesn't it? In verse 45. This big, thick curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies in the temple, the place where once a year... The high priest would enter into God's special presence on the Day of Atonement. He couldn't do it any other day. If he did, he would, be, he would die, he would be killed, or he'd be executed. He couldn't do it. He could enter God's presence just once a year, and it was just one person. But because of Jesus' death, because of the greater Day of Atonement, we can know God You see, rebellion and sin means we're separated from God. Rebellion and sin means that we're distant from God, unable to enter into his presence, enjoy a close relationship with him. But Jesus' sacrifice in our place for our rebellion and sin means that the barrier is demolished. The curtain is split in two, torn in two. So we have 24-7 access to God. We can know him. We can come into his presence. Our sins have been nailed to the cross with Jesus. And so we can come to Father without fear of judgment, without fear of punishment, because the curtain is torn in two. The cross is important because it gives us a saviour. It's the saviour who calls out with a loud voice in verse 46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The greatest display of love is nearly at an end. The the, the greatest sacrifice is, is coming to an end with Jesus praying and quoting from the Old Testament, something that Jesus seems to exemplify when he's on the cross. He he prays and he quotes from the scriptures. And he quotes here Psalm 31, verse 5, Into your hands I commit my spirit. But the verse goes on, Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. At death, Jesus testifies to the faithfulness of God. Trusting in his Father, knowing he'll be with him and the thief in paradise at his death, knowing that his Father loves him. Earlier on, uh, in one of the other Gospels, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But at this point now, he can say, My Father, my Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
the cross really is the most important event in history. Because it shows us, yes, it shows us the reality of judgment. It shows us why the cross is important, why this is serious, but it also provides us with a wonderful saviour, doesn't it? A saviour that knew what he was doing, endured everything, the pain, the physical pain, the spiritual pain for us. And then he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is where we need to consider the response of the cross. I hope you can appreciate the, the, the powerful reality of the cross. And this is why we need to ask the question, what is your response? What is your response to, to Jesus dying on the cross for your sins? Will, will you take the forgiveness offered? Will you take the, the paradise instead of the judgment, the, the knowing God instead of the rebellion? Because, because the cross it demands a response, as our third point shows. Now, I, I deliberately didn't zero in on all of the responses, uh, so we can look at some of them now. And there are quite a few of responses, but let me just zero in on six very briefly responses to Jesus and the cross. Not all of them positive ones, by the way, that we should follow. The, the first one is this, that we saw, we saw weeping, didn't we, in verse 27. Which I said, at one level, it is, is the correct response, isn't it? I hope you are moved by the reality and story of the cross. I hope this does flicker inside you some kind of emotion. Indifference really isn't an option when you consider the cross, when you consider the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really can't be. But what Jesus is doing here is saying, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and others. Weep for your sins that will bring judgment, not my death that will bring life. The correct response to the cross is to take your sins seriously. Your rebellion against, against God seriously. And, and yes, weep. Weep for sin is horrible, isn't it? The problem is, of course, most of us don't see that. It's the case. And that's certainly the case for the people in our second response, where we see in our second response, sneering. You a sneerer? We see it particularly in verse 35, don't we, with the leaders? They hated Jesus. They wanted him gone and delighted in his death, and, and sneering often comes in the form of mockery. Is this something you've done? Have you mocked Jesus? Have you mocked the cross? Because to do so is to be ignorant of just how important the cross is. Don't be a sneerer. Don't be a, a mocker. Instead, if you like, be a turner. Our third response is to be a turner. That's the response of the thief on the cross, isn't it? He, he sees who, who Jesus is and he, he turns to him as his king. Well, first of all, actually, he sees his own sin. He sees his own rebellion. He sees his own guilt. And then he turns to his king and he says, remember me, remember me. It's a cry for salvation, isn't it? And the words, they imply trust. This thief who was going to die on the cross, just hours later, his legs would be broken and he would die. He turned to Jesus from his sin and trusted in his king, in his saviour. Knowing that even though he was dying on the cross... Jesus could deliver him. So turn. Turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. That is the correct response of the cross, isn't it? That and praise. Our fourth response is praise. I, I'm sure some of you were worrying that I was missing out verse 47. Verse 47, the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. And the cross should make you want to praise God because of who Jesus is, the righteous man, the innocent one who dies in our place. And the amazing reality here is the Roman soldier, an officer, a Gentile, is praising God in, in the same time that a, that a Jewish criminal on the cross is turning to Jesus. They both get it. 
We should be praising God for his forgiveness because of the cross. We should be praising God for his salvation because of the cross. We should be praising God for paradise because of the cross. We should be praising God for Jesus' sacrifice because of the cross. We should be praising God for the darkness and judgment Jesus endured for us as a result of the cross. And we should be praising God for the cross that tears the curtain in two and gives us God. Praise God for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for Jesus. Are you praising God? Are you praising Jesus as a result of the cross? Maybe your fifth, your response is our fifth response, which is regret. Or or perhaps even repentance in verse 48. We read after the centurion's comments, when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. And this this beating of breasts is precisely the same action as the tax collector in Luke 18, verse 13, when he then says, God, have mercy on me, me, a sinner. So perhaps some in the crowd really were genuinely repentant, really were genuinely sorry and, and turned from their sin to Jesus. It's tantalizing, but, but, but they might also have just been simply regretting what happened. Since they beat their breast, and then what did they do? They went away. They turned away from the cross. They saw that this was a bad thing, yes, but then went on their way and then lived their life as if this wasn't important. It didn't impact them any further. And please, if that is you, or if that has been you, can I say, beat your breast and continue to beat your breast and say, Father, forgive me. Don't turn away from the cross. Turn to the cross. Don't turn away from Jesus in simple regret. Turn to Jesus in repentance. Regret is not enough. Repentance is needed. Then finally, our sixth response is risk. We haven't touched upon Joseph of Arimathea yet in verses 50 to 56. He takes Jesus' body down, doesn't he? And he he puts uh, the body in a new tomb, probably one of his tombs. Uh, As a a rich man, he would have had a new tomb prepared for his death. And he was a man waiting for the kingdom of God and was part of the Jewish council, uh, one of the leaders of the council, but he disagreed with their decision. But then, I don't know if you noticed, he risks his reputation and his life by going first to Pilate, the head authority in the land, and asking Jesus, uh, asking Pilate, can I take this man, this criminal that you condemned, off the cross so I can bury him? And at the same time, in public, he's risking his reputation and his status as as a leader among the leaders of the Jewish council by doing this. And, And of course, he doesn't know that Jesus is going to rise from the dead. He's just faithfully doing this. He's risking this, not knowing the future. Risking the mocking and the repercussions from his fellow leaders. He was going against the grain, wasn't he? Something we all have to get used to if we're going to follow Jesus as a result of the cross. How much do you risk for Jesus as a result of the cross? Joseph of Arimathea didn't know that Jesus was going to rise from the grave, and yet we know that Jesus also rose from the grave. So how much do we risk for Jesus as a result of the cross? Six responses. The question is, what is your response? You can't just hide this under the, under the carpet. You've got to, the cross demands a response. This is why it's so important. We all did a census last week, didn't we? The government, in a sense, demanded that we did a census or we get a fine. Well, a census only comes around every 10 years and in the big scheme of things, not, it's not that important. And yet, how much more important is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? And it demands a response. We can't just sit on the fence. It demands a response. What is your response? 
One of my favorite descriptions, one of my favorite responses to the cross outside of the Bible is the musings of the 6th century AD poet and hymn writer. I'm sure you all have heard of him. Romanus the Melodist. Lived in Constantinople. And he states these wonderful words at the end uh, that we'll finish with. Your vaunted cross tree sends tremors through the universe. The earth is quaking, the sky is black, rocks are splitting, the temple veil is in shreds. Those in the tombs are rising up and corpses shout, Hades, don't you understand? Adam is beginning his return to paradise. This is why the cross is so important. Because it is a cross that turns the world upside down. It's a cross that says, Adam, humanity, can now go back to paradise and be with God. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for the cross. We praise you and thank you that it is such an important event in history, the event in history of the resurrection that, that, that really did send tremors through the universe, that literally sent a quaking of the earth. The sky was black and, uh, and we see the temple uh, shred in two. And we see, Lord Father, the reality that those who are in Adam, humanity, as a result of Jesus' death, and as a result of Jesus' sacrifice, can come to you now. We'll know that one day we will be with you now. And so, Father, we thank you for the cross. Help us to respond appropriately to the cross. Help us to turn to Jesus and help us to praise you as a result of the cross. In Jesus' precious name we can pray this. Amen. That's what we're going to do now. We're going to praise God in response to the cross. It's an invitation. The song is, come and see, come and see, come and see the King who loved you and died on the cross for you. Again, at home you can sing out loud and, and obviously here let us sing in our hearts as we respond in praise to the cross.
if you're watching on catch up this is where the service ends so thanks for watching